Here we are. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are, and good afternoon, wherever you might be. So welcome to everyone. Um, today, we're going to deal with a really important topic in this series on COVID, and it's on the relationship and the link between COVID-19 and air pollution. If there's one thing that we know about COVID, it's that we don't know very much about it. And one of the great unknowns about COVID too are the links that COVID might have with air pollution. So we hope for some clarity and insight from the three speakers that we have today and our two discussants. So that I don't interrupt the flow of what we're going to hear today, let me begin by introducing our three speakers in the order in which they will appear and our discussants. And after, after our speakers and discussants have gone, we will open the floor for questions. You can, either, you can either ask your questions verbally or through the chat line, and I will forward them to, uh, to, to our speakers and our discussants. So we have three extremely well-qualified speakers to address this issue. Our first speaker of the day is going to be David Wheeler. David is very well known to the World Bank, and he has a very long CV too. Currently, David is a senior fellow at, at WRI, which is the World Resources Institute. Prior to that, he was a lead economist in the World Bank, worked in the CGD, and prior to that, he was a professor at Boston University. And one of the marks, I've known David for a very long time, one of the marks of David's work is that he's always ahead of the curve, especially when it comes to data. Long ago, it was on pollution, then it was on forests, and now David is on to the whole COVID issue. And it'll be wonderful to hear from, from, from David. Then we'll move to Bo Peter Andre, who's currently a consultant in the bank who's doing work on crisis analytics. Bo has had stints not only at the World Bank, but also at the OECD, at the EC, ADB, and at the Dutch government. And he has a book, The Theory and Applications of Dynamic Spatial Analysis. And I downloaded that book last night to read it. And I can assure you, it is not bedtime reading. You really, really have to focus if you want to understand about the dynamics of spatial analysis. Um, finally, last but not least, we'll have Anna Hansel, who is Professor of Envir Environmental Epidemiology at the University of Leicester. Prior to that, she held positions at Imperial College and was Associate Director of the Health Statistics <coughs> Unit for the UK. And then each of our speakers will speak for about 14 minutes at about a 13 minute mark. I will rudely interrupt you and ask you to wind up. And then we will give seven minutes to each of our discussants. Our first discussant is going to be Sho McLeal, who is a lead economist in the Urban Development Unit and a global lead. For anyone that knows anything about urban economics, you will know and have read Sho Mick's work. He's extremely well published and has led a lot of our thinking in the bank on the economics of urbanization, agglomeration, and development. And, and then we will finally have comments from Urvashi Narayan, who's, a, who's also a lead economist in the Environmental and Natural Resources Unit of the World Bank. And she's also extremely well known, especially on air pollution, where she's doing incredible things in countries with deep air pollution problems, and is our go-to person in the World Bank on problems of air pollution. Wherever she too is widely published in journals like Jean and elsewhere. So, without further ado, I would like to hand the virtual floor over to our first speaker, who is David Wheeler. So, David, it's all yours, and you have 14 minutes, and I will interrupt you at the 13 minute mark. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. And I'm now going to go to share mode here and bring up my slides. Uh, Thanks very much for your kind introduction and welcome to everyone. Uh, I'm here at, really as a reporter on joint work, which has recently been undertaken by the Development Research Group and the Bank's Development Economics Vice Presidency and the Global Practice Group for Social, Urban, Rural and Resilience. And I'm here to provide some introductory context by talking about an enterprise that we began very recently uh, to look at the question of whether one might be able to model the spread of COVID-19 in a tractable way and in a way that would be useful for developing countries. And the focus this morning, as you can see, will be on the US and Philippines uh, with this brief uh, visual timeline of the spread of the epidemic in the two places, but I'll return to that uh, momentarily. 
We're trying to respond to a challenge here, which is very unusual. As we all know, COVID-19 is spreading very rapidly. Uh, countries need to anticipate how this spread will occur as best they can. But at the same time, for many countries, uh, particularly low-income countries, time is scarce, resources are limited, and there, there really is a need for some methodologies that will help uh, to identify places that may be subject to spread of COVID that are not currently afflicted. Our project then was, was a major challenge for us because it has been formed and implemented very, very rapidly. We only began in March. And our task has been to develop a model that is conceptually sound, but at the same time, simply designed, uh, easy to explain, easy to transport across regions and income levels, easy to estimate and robust, nevertheless, to estimation problems. And there are three case studies that we're undertaking for the US, the Philippines, and uh, we are now moving into South Africa as well. I thought that uh, to begin with, I would actually prevent you, present you a visual timeline of the evolution of COVID quickly. Uh, in the U.S. at continental scale, in the U.S. state of Georgia, and in Luzon, Philippines. And the reason I'm going to start with this is to give you a sense of this, the central problem that we face in modeling, which is handling what I'll call multipolar spread. You see on the screen then a picture of the United States at the county level, the small outlines there are U.S. counties, in early March before this problem really emerged uh, to any significant degree. And as these slides unfold, you're going to see color scaling going from blue to green, yellow, brown, into red, and finally lavender to give you a sense of the severity of uh, the infection rate in each county. So that what you are going to see now uh, is standardized by population to make viewing easy. As you see these slides for each case, uh, it's good to look for three things. The first is the appearance of poles for the outbreak, places where things begin, then the extension outward from those poles, and finally the joining together of geographic extensions into larger patterns. So here we are on March 3rd. We see the beginning of the emergence of some spot on March 17th. March 24th shows us clear emergence of some poles, which then extend outward by the 31st. April 7th, you can see some severely impacted areas forming. Here is April 21st, the process continues through May 12th. And finally, June 2nd, and here, after the process of emergence and extension, you see a joining up where huge regions of the United States have now been affected. Just to reinforce these ideas, let me now go to a uh, regional case. This is the US state of Georgia. Uh, and let me begin. Um, on March 15th, which is about two weeks after uh, there was a funeral in Albany, Georgia, which is the circled city in the southwest of the diagram. Uh, lots of people attended. They came from various areas. On the map, you see three circled areas. In the northwest is Atlanta. Uh, in the southwest is Albany. And in the middle is Macon. Atlanta is, of course, a huge transportation hub and very densely populated. Now watch the evolution and spread of COVID as we go forward. Into March, you see what happened after the funeral in the Southwest. You see the spread from Atlanta. And now you see uh, the virus beginning to spread out by April 19th, becoming more severe. Here is May 3rd when join up begins between the Atlanta area and the Albany area. And by June 1st, most of the map has been overwhelmed, including the area around Macon. Now let's move to Luzon, Philippines. Again, we're going to start on March in early March. Here, there was hardly any incidents then. You see three circles again, one near Manila, two in other regions which will turn out to be affected quickly. We see the beginning spread from Manila. We see it moving outward from that area. Then we see a seeding occurring in other areas. Two poles in the circle areas then become much more severe and there's continued spread, uh, which then uh, simply evolves and progresses. So, this is a pattern that we see everywhere, and I'll refer to it as fractal, meaning there's a sort of an eerie replication of this pattern uh, at continental scale and at regional scale. In all these cases, we see similar patterns, an emergence in several places, a non-uniform pattern of spatial propagation outward, a link up ultimately of the fastest propagating salients in those patterns, and finally, a spread into the areas that were initially surrounded by fast moving salients. This has been the challenge for us. How can we model this process in a way that allows us to predict what may happen next? And in this presentation, I'm going to avoid almost all technical detail. There's a huge amount of it, and I'll be happy to go back and answer any questions that you may have uh, after uh, my presentation in the Q&A session. 
But let me just say that there are three elements here in trying to model this. The first, as you can see, the spread pattern involves interaction with neighboring areas. That's critical. This thing moves from one area to neighboring uh, areas quite inexorably. And in order to model that uh, interaction between two areas, we've used a variant of the well-known gravity modeling approach, familiar from trade theory, uh, from uh, other branches of economics and other disciplines, including epidemiology uh, in, in many applications. And the basic principle is simple. Uh, in this context, interactions between two areas of people who may be infected are simply proportional to the product of the populations of those areas that are infected and uh, inverse, inversely related to the distance between the two populations. But in this case, we're gonna innovate a bit, not by using distance, but by using the travel time, which is a much better uh, measure of proximity. So we're going to then include an element which involves interactions with neighboring areas, another element which involves interactions within each area. And for that, we're gonna use a local measure of population density as our best proxy. And we have to put all this together into a growth model, a model that has growth dynamics. We're going to use the Gompertz model for that. It's a figure model from technology diffusion, uh, from epidemiology, and from population studies. I'd like to touch very briefly on two aspects of this that are relevant. On the interactions with neighboring areas, uh, there was a challenge in trying to quantify travel time in this context. And without dwelling on this too long, I'd like to advertise a bit for a wonderful new resource that we use that's available for everyone in the world now for free called the open source routing machine, which allows you to use open street maps to compute travel times between any two points uh, for free on a massive scale. For this particular application, we had to compute hundreds of thousands of travel times. Uh, fortunately for replication of this approach, you only have to do this once and we did it all for free. The basic idea is for each area, uh, you take all areas with which it might feasibly interact, and we set a radius of 200 miles around the area. And then you calculate travel times to the centroids of, in this case, other areas, counties in the U.S., uh, and, and that gives you the domain within which you do measurement. Down below, you can see uh, the travel time radii that are color-coded from five U.S. counties and two areas in Philippines. And, of course, depending on road conditions, travel times can vary a lot. Uh, once you have this, then you weight the infections in each neighboring unit by inverse travel time and add all those up for each unit or each county in the U.S. case, for example, to get a total measure of interaction. So that's one of the terms in uh, the modeling approach. On the growth modeling, this is my only brush past mathematics, and I'll be very quick. Just one point I wanted to make. The Gump Gompertz function is quite useful in this context. It provides a pretty good fit to actual data on the spread of infections. As you can see on the right there, uh, an exemplary picture from South Korea. And the reason I wanted to bring up the math is to highlight that red alpha, which is there in the middle, which we will see again in the econometrics. The basic idea behind the Gompertz curve is quite simple. It says that the rate of change of something is proportional to the gap between its ultimate destination and the current state. So the bigger that gap, the faster the growth will be. Having said all this by way of introduction, then uh, I'm going to pass immediately to some econometric results, which we got, uh, which suggests that, in fact, this very simple model Two modes of interaction and a, and a growth, a modeling context, give you fairly powerful results. So this data involves both the U.S. and the Philippines. We're looking at changes from March 17th to April 14th. We have the three terms I've already discussed as variables in this model. The first is the log of the initial infection rate, and the, this is basically minus the value of alpha from the mass of the Gompertz curve. We have the travel time weighted measure that I had uh, discussed. And finally, we have local population density. In the case of the US and Philippines, you could see by the standard canons of statistics, these are really quite powerful results. They're very robust. Uh, in each case, the signs are right. Uh, in the case of maximum population density locally, uh, the two coefficients are even very close to one another. For the others, they differ. Uh, and that's something one could discuss. But in any case, the model seems robust. I sh should point out one uh, side issue here, as part of fitting this model, we had to use a grid search algorithm to fit the parameter for travel time uh, in this relationship by which if you have an infection in, an, inter in, in a, an interacting area, you wait by inverse travel time. That isn't necessarily travel time 
uh, to the first power, just dividing by t, as you can see up above, it might be a different power. The only reason I'm bringing this up is that it makes a big difference. We got an exponent of 0.7, and the green line uh, in this graph shows you that, in fact, that gives you a much broader reach for this infection than you would get if you were dividing by travel time alone, that's the blue line, or the square of travel time. Uh, that's the, the reddish brown line. So you can see that an implication of our result is that the influence of, of places that are fairly far away is still significant in determining what happens in a particular county. All that said, let's move to the central question here, which is uh, what do the predictions look like from this model? In order to set this up, I've predicted outside of the sample in the case of both the U.S. and Philippines. By that, I mean that we start as if uh, we're in April 14th, and all we know is what we have learned up until April 14th, and we forecast 28 days ahead. Then having done that, we compare that with what actually happened to see how well we do. In order to illustrate this in a very simple way, uh, I've divided the predictions into three groups, the lowest 10th percentile, the middle 80, the middle 80 percentile points, and the highest 10th percentile, or the 90th percentile or higher. Uh, the graph here shows you on the vertical axis the actual infection growth, and uh, on the horizontal axis we're showing then the, the uh, predictions offered by the model uh, at the lowest, the medium, and the highest levels. And what this says is simply that we do an awful lot better. Our prediction is that growth is uh, much higher in counties that in fact do grow more quickly. And as you can see in some cases this is fairly spectacular. I've isolated um, the case on the right because that's uh, the most spectacular of all. The P's in here are, are different population groups, which are defined above P1 through P4. P1 is the largest cities, P4 is the smallest. Turn to the Philippines, we see the same thing again. Uh, as we move up through the prediction percentiles, we see actual growth going up. And again, what these results suggest, as they do in the case of the U.S., is that uh, in the highest 10th percentile, we actually go a long way toward identifying areas that in the next period of time, in the month following the modeling exercise, we will see rapid growth of the virus. So this model seems to be pretty robust. Now, having gone all this distance, let me then stop uh, and extend a little bit. We want to extend the model and look at some other measures that might be relevant. Uh, and one of those is vulnerability. And here I join my colleagues briefly in uh, providing a very quick introduction to topics that Bo and Anna will then cover in much more detail. One of the things you might want to look at is vulnerability. And in this particular case, life expectancy uh, might be a measure that you would want to look at in that context. This is a regression result for all the covariates of life expectancy that enter into these discussions. Uh, there's no, I don't want to dwell on this. I simply want to point out that Many of the covariates that have been identified with uh, the spread of PM10 and vulnerability are here present for life expectancy, and I get extremely strong results for PM2.5 as one of those covariates. Now, that in itself, uh, this, this uh, finding of covariation doesn't necessarily mean that we have causation here. However, I wanted to turn quickly before I close to this one graph. This is built up from the census tract level in the U.S., very detailed data that show something which is quite remarkable. The red here uh, denotes counties which are uh, most afflicted by M2.5, and this is, to an almost eerie degree, a picture of coal-fired power in the U.S., particularly in Georgia there. The, the red zone areas there are some of the biggest coal-fired power plants in the U.S., so it's clear that pollution generally defined seems to have uh, a measure of correlation that's fairly significant with life expectancy. That said, I've gone back to the original model, and put in both life expectancy. Please, and please begin to wind up, David. Sue. Sure, I'm, I'm, this is effectively wrapping it up. Uh, and what we find is that they have the results have the expected signs. They're not tremendously powerful statistically. I don't think they add too much to our predicted power, but they certainly suggest that there is a correlation here beyond the part that is explained uh, by the initial model that I talked about. So just to summarize then very quickly, the challenge was very rapidly to put together a model of COVID spread. We put together elements including a gravity model of interactions, local interactions in the highest density areas, used a Gompertz formulation to uh, characterize change. We got similar strong fits for both the U.S. and Philippines, a similar pattern for the extent to which travel time affects uh, the influence of infections. 
the, the forecasts look promising. It looks like they do differentiate subsequent experiences of cities. And we're now undertaking some extended experiments with the model. You've seen a quick illustration for the US. We're working on Philippines and subsequently we'll work on South Africa. Let me just close there. Thank you so much, David. That was really fascinating. Thank you, as always. Um, Bo, over to you now, please. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen as well. Here we go. All right. Thanks, everybody. And thanks, uh, uh, Richard, for your introduction. Um, like you said, my, uh, my background uh, is, uh, is it's quite technical. I did my PhD in econometric theory, mostly working with uh, processes that evolve over space and over time. And that's really the angle uh, from which uh, I come at this. Um, I work in a, in a unit strategy, analytics, finance, and solutions and knowledge in the World Bank. And what we're doing is uh, we're working on crisis analytics. So whenever there is a crisis somewhere, I'm trying to put in together uh, a relevant data set to, to, to come at some, some useful policy advice and, and guide through that. Uh, and it's quite unnatural to have a crisis that large, but uh, still, uh, it's, it's the angle from which I, I come at this. Um, so I started thinking about this actually early in February, and uh, there was uh, the, the first signs of, of how this virus spreads were were quite quite a, a positive picture. Uh, uh, the first sense was that this virus was not airborne, uh, and that airborne transmission was not believed to uh, to explain a substantial part of, of the virus spread dynamics. Then uh, in March, uh, uh, an important paper by Van Dormalen painted a slightly darker picture, saying, "Well, actually, we have some evidence that suggests that SARS-CoV-2 can survive up to three days on some surfaces." and uh, concluded that uh, aerosol transmission might actually be feasible. So uh, from that perspective, uh, if this virus would be uh, airborne, then you might expect similar dynamics as we know exists with other airborne uh, viruses. So there's a quite a huge body of literature on this. And uh, the general takeaways is that for various classes of uh, viruses that are uh, airborne, uh, we know that the presence of fine particulate matter um, uh, actually increases the infection risk. So um, if that holds true, then we might expect some similar dynamics uh, in, in COVID-19. So when I started looking at the data early on, I quickly concluded um, that, uh, uh, in, at least in the Netherlands, uh, the case, cases seem to double in areas where uh, pollution concentrations increased by just 20% above guidelines. We're going to talk a little bit more about uh, how we got there. Um, but I want, wanted to show a quick picture uh, uh, to everybody to show that we can uh, quite well see uh, uh, pollution from space. So it's quite easy to track uh, uh, pollution distributions uh, across countries and within countries. So if we just have a, a general look at uh, the situation in Italy, which was uh, really uh, escalating uh, around the time when I started uh, thinking about this problem. Uh, and we see that in the north, uh, the nitrogen dioxide, which is just one pollutant, but uh, one for which uh, data is quite easily accessible, we see that, uh, that the highest concentrations are really centered in the north. And then if you just pull up a, a map, and this is from, from, from early April, they can see that the case densities uh, seem to uh, have some similarity in how they are distributed across the country. Um, this situation has seemed to be quite stable. This is data from, uh, from last week. Uh, in the middle, again, uh, the cases on the left, the same pollution map. And then on the right, I just quickly pulled up a population density map uh, just to show that actually by uh, briefly looking at the data, the similarities between pollution and case densities are uh, much more striking than uh, than uh, with population density. So that begs the question, uh, what, what is driving this? You can also look at, at some other countries. In France, you see that uh, the highest case densities are in the northern part across the border with Belgium, Germany, and that's generally where you see a lot of cases. And then if you start looking across Europe, um, then this seems to be a recurring pattern, but actually not in all places. Um, First, I highlighted the Netherlands, which I personally analyzed, and we'll talk about the details there. In the bottom, you see France uh, and Italy. 
Um, I'm putting uh, on the right uh, uh, the case distribution in Poland, uh, just to point out that in many places, the regions are actually quite, quite big. So even though there seems to be some similarity uh, with the pollution distribution, it's very, very hard to, to draw any solid conclusions here, just by the fact that these regions are also large and we only have a few of them. Uh, then in Austria, we actually see a different pattern. Uh, actually, the highest case densities are uh, in places where pollution is quite low. But we know that uh, uh, this country has, has mountains, uh, so the terrain is, is completely different from one place to another. So there could just be uh, other factors than, than pollution that are important. And then uh, in uh, the United Kingdom, England, uh, you, you see that it's not at all that clear. You see in the, in, in the south part, a lot of pollution cases seem to be a bit higher. But then in the north, you also see a lot of cases per population. And that just shows that these areas are all quite large uh, and they don't have a lot of people. Um, so uh, it's not actually all that clear uh, how the relationship with population comes into play here. So apart from just an obvious similarity, there's a lot of other factors that you have to think of. Here, I'm just quickly showing the same pollution map that David uh, pulled up in the previous presentation and then overlaying it with, uh, with, with cases just to again see the, the striking similarity here. So when it comes to thinking through what's behind what's what's behind this uh, this correlation, there, there could be many explanations. Uh, there could be actually direct relationships, and uh, Anna will talk a bit more about that. But this would have to do with that pollution uh, increases the susceptibility of the virus uh, through health impacts. Or it might even be the case that uh, the virus uh, attaches on or suspends into aerosols, and then uh, that particulate matter uh, helps the spread of the virus. Uh, there could be other forms of associated relationships, uh, meaning that air pollution could just proxy uh, various risk factors. And this could be quite broad. It could mean that pollution tends to be produced in, uh, in working environments where a lot of people work in cramped conditions. And it's really just the fact that there's a lot of people working in cramped uh, locations that increases the transmission. Um, and then finally, there are, of course, completely different uh, explanations to these correlations, which could be just incorrect, uh, spurious trends. It just happens to be that pollution uh, trends in the same way. And uh, there could be other confounding relationships, meaning that uh, it's really population density that proxies for activity, and then you expect both more cases and more pollution. So some of these factors, we can treat them in a statistical method, um, but in the end, uh, we can exclude some of these explanations, but we'll always remain uh, uh, that uh, even if we can show that there's a robust explanation, these type of analyses that at least I'm going to show uh, are not intended to really explain uh, why you see this uh, uh, this correlation. So just uh, the analytical strategy uh, to summarize, we're going to need granular data on uh, COVID-19 cases and very precise air pollution measurements. This already puts a lot of constraints on, on uh, what, what, what areas we can study rapidly. Ideally, we would have patient level data, but this is not available everywhere or not always open. Uh, we're going to need reliable data on a number of control variables that have to do with health preconditions, which are certainly not available everywhere. And then we're also going to need a reasonable sample size, or at least very small area district uh, dist uh, units. Uh, so one of the, the places that kind of have this, uh, at least early on, uh, uh, making that data available is the Netherlands. So I analyzed 355 municipalities in the Netherlands, which are all quite small. Um, I looked at different uh, dependent variables, confirmed cases uh, per, per capita, with confirmed hospital admissions per capita. I also did uh, case counts. Um, and then I used a variety of air pollution uh, data sets, uh, two based on ground measurements, PM2.5, PM10. And I also looked at remote sense data. Um, generally, these considerations don't really change the conclusion, which is good. Uh, then I looked at a, a number of control variables, including population density, pre-existing uh, health conditions, uh, and uh, uh, proxies for case severity. Used a number of demographic uh, data sets, including age, household composition. Uh, and then uh, in terms of methodological considerations, uh, I looked at non-linearities, uh, looked at alternative distributional assumptions, the influence of outliers. Um, uh, using a variety of tools to control for spatial dynamics and so on. 
you can read the details in the paper. I'm just going to present you the main simple uh, estimation results as most of the more sophisticated considerations do not really seem to impact the main conclusions. Uh, here in this table, I'm presenting very simple linear regression results. The first model includes uh, all the control variables that I could get my hands on, which uh, are uh, 22, uh, ranging in, in the categories that I just mentioned. Uh, in this model, we see immediately that PM2.5 is an extremely significant and a strong predictor. Uh, every point in PM2.5 seems to re uh, raise the number of cases uh, per 100,000 by 10. And at this point in the data, the average was about 20 uh, cases for every 100,000 uh, people in these areas. So uh, meaning that a two point increase seems to correlate with about a doubling uh, on average. Um, then the other models, uh, they take into account spatial dynamics, uh, spatial dependence. You see that the, the parameters uh, value changes a bit in magnitude. Uh, but those uh, familiar with these types of models, uh, when, when you're modeling spatial feedback, there's, there, there's a multiplier effect. Uh, so generally, if you take into account, it actually seems to suggest the same uh, relationship linearly, a doubling in cases when uh, pollution increased by uh, two points. Um, what I uh, then did is uh, I looked at the nonlinearities uh, in this relationship. There's a lot of factors that might actually influence or might be important when it comes to the relationship between pollution and, and COVID cases. Uh, there could be uh, weather variables uh, that influence how impactful pollution actually is. Uh, there might also be economic uh, uh, conditions that, that uh, increase the vulnerability uh, of people. So, um, for example, in poor regions, people might not be able to uh, protect themselves all too well against pollution, hence the impact from pollution onto COVID uh, uh, might be higher. So there's a lot of reasons to even in this, uh, in, in, if we're thinking about a simple correlation, there might be a lot of influencing factors that, that, uh, that, uh, that determine how this, this correlation actually looks from one place to another. So I used a nonlinear regression uh, method, used a number of uh, important control variables, and I also used X and Y coordinates. So effectively, uh, this type of regression uh, actually allows you to model the relationship between COVID and air pollution in such a way that this relationship varies from uh, across levels in the data, and in this case, also explicitly from one location to another. Then uh, I did a simple prediction exercise um, predicting uh, what, what the expected, or at least from, from the model's perspective, how the case distribution looks like uh, when, when areas have about 10 uh, uh, PM levels, and then increasing it to 12, uh, calculate the, the change. Uh, and then you see that, that, that this, this, uh, this effect differs uh, from one uh, area to another. So you can draw a bit of a distribution, and then you see that there's a lot of heterogeneity uh, in, uh, in, in the increase uh, in cases. So again, it seems to center around uh, a doubling in, ca in cases when pollution increases from 10 to 12 uh, points. But uh, this relationship really seems to vary from one uh, area to another. This is also important because, uh, at least from the World Bank's perspective, we're, we're pretty much concerned about the developments in, in poorer countries, and these tend to have higher pollution concentrations. Um, and uh, just this heterogeneity in, uh, in a very small country like the Netherlands already shows that it, it's not, not that trivial uh, to extra extrapolate this relationship to, to countries where the conditions might be, uh, might be different. So that kind of like brings me to a bit, a bit of a summary of the main takeaways for, from, uh, from the analysis. And that is that PM2.5 is a, is a well-known health risk uh, factor. And we already know that short-term exposure to pollution has shown to decrease infection risk for various viral infections. Uh, this is my last slide. Uh, and then emerging analyses uh, across the board seem to point toward PM2.5 as a strong predictor uh, of COVID-19 incidents. And that seems to be robust to a, a, a number of control variables and different methodological approaches. There are some cautionary notes in order, uh, I would say, and uh, first, these type of analyses, uh, they're not intended to explain why uh, or how this correlation works. Uh, we also know that the available data on COVID-19 is at best suboptimal. 
Um, and uh, we don't yet know from just an analysis on a country like this, how this relationship extrapolates to higher PM2.5 concentrations. Uh, a systematic review on the applicability of these findings across countries uh, would be highly beneficial at this point. Uh, and as most of this literature is, is still in early uh, stages, uh, I'd really caution everybody on, on how, how, how to interpret these results. Uh, so uh, I'm happy to take a lot of questions in the end. Uh, I'll keep it at, uh, at this for now. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bo. That was fascinating as well. In particular, the quantitative magnitude that you've come up with for the Netherlands. Um, and it's over to you now to give us some insight as economists as to what's really behind this. Uh, teach us some epidemiology of what's going on here. Thank you. Over to you, Anna. Thank you. I'll just uh, set up sharing my screen. So uh, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect clarity. Yes. Yeah, fantastic. So I started my career as a researcher into public health. And for the last 20 years or so, I've been working in environmental epidemiology, primarily in air pollution, but uh, other uh, types of uh, environmental exposure. So I'm going to give a talk very much from an epidemiological and public health perspective on this. Um, so it's a, a, a different starting point from um, our previous speaker on this. Um, but I will start with a similar uh, uh, slide here showing um, the air pollution levels in China and Italy. And these were two of the epicenters of COVID-19. Um, or two of the initial epicenters. And it wasn't very long before people said the air pollution levels are high here and in Northern Italy, we've seen high amounts of COVID-19. Could these potentially be related? And there've been um, a number of papers um, that have been published and more uh, uh, opinions that have also been put out. I've picked out this particular paper um, from, um, which was one of the first, um, which was uh, um, for Europe which was uh, uh, suggesting that the highest levels of COVID-19 deaths were in the most polluted regions. So uh, that throws up a hypothesis, but it's a correlation. And um, you need to look beyond that to see what else is going on, because um, these areas with a high air pollution level tend to be the areas with the high population density. They tend to be very well connected areas. So they're where the infection came in first, got a hold spread, uh, um, through the, the uh, density of the population. Um, they also may have uh, um, areas of deprivation um, and that uh, in itself is a, is a risk factor. So I think to be able to understand um, the relationship uh, or potential relationship between air pollution and COVID-19, you need to uh, first start off thinking about the epidemiology. So I've got some figures here that uh, come from the UK um, there are similar types of figures that are coming out in terms of COVID-19 mortality in relation to age. So age is a really big uh, risk factor for COVID-19, as is uh, being male. Um, but that, those risk factors only seem to come into play uh, for severe disease when you're over about the age of 40, unless you have other underlying conditions. So that means if you're a developing country with um, a, a large percentage of your population in younger age groups, um, it probably means that the risk of uh, death and severe complications um, is, is much lower in your population if you have a, a younger population. So um, the second thing to comment is just about this top right hand side about the usual all cause mortality rate. So COVID-19 is a new disease. It's not behaving like uh, some other diseases. So pneumonias and uh, uh, various other respiratory diseases usually have this J shape relationship with uh, mortality with a, a high, uh, higher impact in those less than one years old in babies. Um, we don't see that or we haven't seen that with COVID-19. And then thinking about the risk factors, um, people think of it as a respiratory disease, but actually uh, the comorbidities that are showing up really clearly are cardiovascular ones, hypertension, um, heart disease, also uh, metabolic disease such as diabetes, and um, in fact, certainly in the UK, our asthmatics have been underrepresented in those with the more severe disease, which is interesting. It's a systemic disease. I think we're finding that the severe 
uh, uh, COVID-19 is not just impacting on the lungs, it's uh, affecting the blood vessels as well. And that might be important for long-term sequelae um, of the disease and um, implications for follow-up. So I've put other risk factors here, obesity and non-white ethnicity in Western countries. Um, so whether uh, people who are uh, from Asia, South Asia and Africa um, experience uh, higher rates in Asia and Africa, I think we still have to, uh, you know, we still need more information on. In the Western countries, these non-white ethnicities tend to uh, be more deprived. Um, they live in the um, uh, very densely populated uh, areas and uh, they have higher rates of co uh, comorbidity, which might well be related to the deprivation. And it's very difficult to untangle um, that, uh, those, uh, all those factors. So um, how might air quality impact on COVID-19? And I think it's worth thinking through what mechanisms might underlie any uh, uh, observed relationships. So I think an obvious one is that the uh, air pollution impact is indirect. There's lots of evidence that air pollution increases the risk of chronic disease. And we know that chronic disease gives you a risk of more severe COVID-19 and death from COVID-19. And if that's the case, and the only mechanism, you might expect the risks to be of a similar order of magnitude to previous studies looking at air pollution and mortality. There are some other potential mechanisms which I, I, I think are more short term and direct, and they would be around increasing infectivity. So um, that might occur if the virus is uh, being carried on particulates. It might occur through inflammation of the lung uh, from air pollution, which we know is a, a feature of air pollution exposure, um, or it might occur through some specific mechanisms. I've got a slide on that. Um, so that would give you uh, an interaction. So you would see higher infection risk in polluted areas. So uh, they, you wouldn't, you'd have higher risks than you see with the previous studies of air pollution and mortality. Um, you might also have uh, an impact of air pollution that if you have severe, uh, if you have uh, an infection, it might make the infection more severe, which might be through these sort of general inflammation. Uh, mechanisms, and we know that uh, air pollution can cause inflammation through body systems. So I'll just tackle uh, a couple of those uh, uh, direct mechanisms. So um, as Bo uh, uh, talked about, there are some studies that suggest that you can detect coronavirus on particles of air pollution. Uh, there's not a lot of studies around. Those studies don't tell us whether uh, the virus uh, material that's detected is viable, nor whether uh, you can pick up enough from the air um, to get an infective dose. I'm not sure we actually know at the moment how much virus constitutes an infective dose. And I think the, the role of aerosols um, in terms of infection is not very well established. We know that it's a droplet. Uh, transmission, um, and if those droplets contaminate surfaces, you can pick them up from surfaces. Um, aerosol transmission is probably a small risk factor, but we don't know how small it is. And um, it's, it's quite important, I think, to get a handle on that because it would affect our social distancing policies uh, right through to, is it safe to use a public toilet, for example? And that's uh, um, some of the things we're grappling with in the UK at the moment uh, as we're uh, coming out of lockdown. So there's another uh, mechanism which is uh, really interesting from a medical perspective. This is a busy slide. Um, just concentrate on the middle bit here. We've got a red uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, um, uh, uh, virus here, and this is the ACE2 receptor in green. So the uh, virus, coronavirus, attaches to this receptor, and that's how it enters the cell. And uh, there is evidence that the uh, that both NO2 and particulate pollution can upregulate, increase the numbers of these ACE2 receptors. Um, what we don't have is direct evidence of uh, um, air pollution levels plus virus um, and some cells um, in a, a, a mechanistic study to say, does uh, the virus uh, plus air pollution give you a more sort of potent uh, risk of infection? Um, than uh, not having the air pollution. And I think we urgently need that uh, to be able to understand some of the epidemiological studies. 
So there are a few epidemiological studies, and as Bo said, it's quite early days. Um, I think one of the problems we've got is where do I look? So uh, my look didn't actually turn up your paper, I'll apologise for that. Uh, so um, I tend to look at the medical studies on PubMed. There is a WHO database that uh, is, is sort of, a, I think, PubMed Plus. Um, you can also look on Med Archive, which is uh, for preprints, but it's, I put a question mark there because they're very variable quality and, um, and there's a huge amount. So people are just putting things up there. They get a press release, they come out in the, in the, um, um, in the media and you're having to react to, to them. Um, and um, there's now concern in me, this is from the British Medical Journal, um, this article here saying that uh, we're actually getting perverse incentives to publish early and possibly too early so that uh, um, there's too much data and not enough information. We have another problem about outcome measures. And um, so again, uh, I think deaths are, well, there's a, there's a whole issue about uh, how you interpret deaths, excess deaths, deaths from COVID-19, they're all defined differently and in different countries. Um, the thing that is really problematic is a case um, because a case um, uh, is dependent on testing and the test who gets selected to be tested has varied um, within areas in, within countries um, and between countries and also has changed over time. So, um, you know, it's been changing in some cases every week as to who's uh, eligible to be tested. Um, and there are very few countries that have tested uh, large numbers of the population. I think South, South Korea and Germany stand out there. Um, I think we've got another challenge, which is around the methodology um, about disease propagation and the previous uh, talks, I think, have tried to get a handle on this. Um, but we're seeing this sort of pulse of infections go out um, and that's not the type of methods that we've developed to look at these short term um, interactions. Um, and then some of our control measures are impacting on the air pollution as well as the transmission. And it then gets very tricky to start to unpicking um, what the true associations might be. I'm going to focus on two, um, I think, quite uh, authoritative studies, or certainly ones that have provoked a lot of discussion. Um, and they're both from the States, um, in part because I think you have uh, good access to data. Uh, one of them came out in April, the uh, second came out in May. Um, they're similar but slightly different designs and the results are slightly different. And um, they're both from very well respected um, air pollution epidemiology groups. Uh, the SHU uh, Francesca Dominici group is at Harvard um, and the uh, Dong Hai Liang and, and Hao Chang are um, at Emory but there's also some Harvard uh, in so um, this slide picks out some of the uh, key um, aspects of these studies. So the colours are not meaningful, they're just so that you can pick out uh, both. Um, the one's using death counts uh, and the Liang study is using deaths and cases. I'm just going to concentrate on the mortality here. Um, they're both looking up to uh, nearly the end of April. They are area level studies, they're comparing US counties. Um, for some reason, there are differences in the number of deaths picked up between the different databases. They both use very well established and good uh, air pollution models um, to uh, give you the, the air pollution levels. Um, but the Wu paper, the first paper, just looked at PM2.5. The second paper looks at NO2 and ozone as well. Slightly different years, but they're looking at long term averages um, in relation to uh, COVID 19. So there are some differences in the um, models that they've used, um, these statistical models. Um, so the uh, second paper has used a, a zero inflated model because um, a lot of the counties had zero deaths during this time period. And I think the other major difference, and we have just touched on that, is that the second paper also adjusted for spatial autocorrelation and probably explains why there are uh, uh, lower uh, results found. These are really impressive amounts of analyses. Um, with the Wu paper, they found a 8% increase in mortality rate per one microgram uh, per meter cubed increase of PM2.5. And this is adjusted for about 20 different confounders, including attempts to look at the state of the 
progression um, of the pandemic uh, infection rates and population density and various population vulnerability factors. Um, the Liam paper finds uh, an association that's not statistically significant with PM2.5, and it's about uh, a third the size. Um, it does find a significant association with NO2, and it expresses that per interquartile range um, of the NO2 exposure, and there's no association with ozone. And then both papers give us some uh, uh, public health type interpretation. And the thing that made me sit up and notice on the Wu Dominici paper was that the coefficients were actually higher than those for all cause mortality that they'd found in a previous um, analysis. And uh, I think the Liang paper commented it's around about 7% uh, uh, of this might have been avoided if you had lower energy. So I think the other thing to note is the PM2 levels were quite low here. They're not comparable to what you'd see in a developing country. Um, in terms of the inference of this, um, we can come back to this in question probably, but uh, epidemiological studies, you want to look at the totality of the evidence and interpret in the light of what you already know. Um, hi, you're giving me a minute to go. That's great. Um, I will just say that the ecological studies are often used in the initial assessments and they're very uh, good if you want to get a quick uh, answer um, for uh, for uh, these types of questions, but uh, you probably want a long-term individual level cut study uh, to help you with that. Um, I think it would be surprising if we didn't see a link between air pollution and COVID-19, given what else we know about air pollution and COVID-19. Um, I have got some a couple of slides here just on public health perspectives about what we can learn from SARS. I can come back to those. Um, in, uh, sorry, I can go back to those in questions if you'd like to uh, know a bit more. Um, but uh, in conclusion, um, the air pollution we already know is associated with risk of chronic disease and um, also with mortality. It's unlikely that we don't also see a link with COVID-19. We're early days in interpreting the evidence. I don't think, and also the Committee of the Medical Effects of Air Pollution, which I sit on in the UK, doesn't feel that the evidence is strong enough to get specific measures against COVID-19 in high air pollution areas that are different from low air pollution areas. Um, I think there's various gaps that we need to fill in to understand this relationship better. And I think one of the positive things, uh, just from a public health perspective, is that if you have a well-functioning public health system, you can uh, achieve low disease transmission. I think that's really important to just hold in mind when we're thinking about the uh, um, air pollution levels, that actually public health measures are really important. Don't lose our focus on that, uh, even when we're thinking about other risk factors. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, without further ado, Let's go to our discussants. And our first discussant is uh, Dr. Shermik Lal from the Urban Unit in the World Bank. Shermik, over to you. Thank you very much, Richard. And uh, I really appreciate the analytic work and empirical analyses that was presented this morning that tells us a little bit about the pathways for the spread of coronavirus and the COVID-19 disease. I think to me, at least from what we do at the World Bank, this work will be very useful in the near term. Uh, cities in many developing countries are really trying to prioritize how and where to allocate medical and civil resources to save lives and to save livelihoods. In particular, I really like the way both David and Bo have chosen to be very spatially aware in their approaches to examine the spread of the virus. And I think, David, your modeling draws on a large body of work in economic geography that relies on market access and gravity-based uh, approaches to measure connectivity. And this is really apt for measuring contagion. And Bo's work does a really nice job in drawing on the spatial econometrics literature pioneered by the likes of Luke Anselin to take into account of spatial trends and spatial clustering. And such a spatial approach is really important because much of the work I see is spatially sort of blind. 
And this makes the work very robust and, uh, uh, and it improves our understanding of the correlates linked to the spread of the virus. My one suggestion here is on both the papers, we may want to address the so-called reflection problem that's often seen in spatial models of social interaction. And here, infection rates, say, of individual zip codes and neighborhoods are endogenous to the broader neighborhood in general. And, and we'd probably want to think about some way of instrumenting for that. Now, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about my feelings on the spatial correlates. And first is the density in coronavirus, where I think I'm just going to share one slide of mine uh, and hope you can uh, see it uh, right here. Uh, where there's been a lot of attention on the downsides of density and the fact that in many dense urban hubs, uh, instead of focusing on the benefits in terms of productivity and livability, this density in this time has been a real transmission belt for the virus. And I think, David, your analysis shows the significance of density in transmission, while Bo's work shows density is not really relevant. But I think what we really need to do is make clear the distinction between density and crowding. And I'd like to just put together, show you some data we put together for New York, where if you were to look at Jackson Heights and Queens, that's the most worst affected neighborhood. Cases are like 4,000 per 100,000 residents. In Chelsea, on the other side, it's 925 per 100,000 residents. But what's of relevant to note here is that Queens is not the densest neighborhood in New York City. Queens has a density of 12,000 people per square kilometer, where in Chelsea, it's about 31,000. So what makes a difference here is neighborhood incomes and associated characteristics, which really temper the extent to which complementary investments in housing and infrastructure and amenities can really transform places from being crowded to becoming dense and livable. And with good planning and land development regulations, in these sort of valuable places, developers have the incentive to build up tall structures, create a lot of floor space. So even when you have a pandemic and you want to shut down and keep social distance, dense places do pretty well. And in fact, to support the World Bank's work on the pandemic, in developing country cities, we have developed a methodology that can help city leaders prioritize places and resources towards these potential hotspots. And these are the places with high contagion risk, uh, even under a lockdown. And what we do here is we distinguish density from crowding by accounting for differences in floor space and availability of amenities. So I think we need to take this density argument a little carefully. Second, on the issue of air quality, as Anna kind of pointed out, the evidence isn't all that clear. And if you were to look at the numbers, air pollution is a really silent killer. It takes about 4 million lives annually. And, and, and most parts of the world, especially in developing countries, cities are way over the WHO guidelines. So I'd be surprised not to see a correlation but I don't really know the extent to which we're untangling the effect of the air pollution on life quality or expectancy from its direct from getting COVID-19. And this is particularly true because over the last two months, we've seen a lot of cities shutting down and there's a lot of lockdown, a lot of NPIs. So air quality measures may have really changed as well. But here, when we think about it, and I'll just take one more minute, is we want to think if you want to do robust work, we need to think structurally. And if PM 2.5 is a combination of emissions from industry and transportation, and they're places with dirty industries, they're likely to have low land prices. And the places with a lot of pass through are not going to be great places to live, right? So in response, people are going to sort. And there's going to be sorting in the land market in cities where a lot of these low value places may get lower income communities who may not be able to afford the homes and the neighborhoods where, you know, high quality of living or social amenities are feasible. And the pollutants may also maybe exacerbate pre-existing health conditions. 
So I think it's really important to think about these sorting issues as we try to build a robust case on air quality. Uh, thank you again for these excellent presentations. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Shermik. Uh, I won't pass any comment over to you, Urvashi. Uh, we're getting some fascinating insights. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Richard. Let me just start by saying um, that really thanking all three presenters for excellent presentations. I think um, this is an area of um, where knowledge is just emerging. There's a lot that we don't know. And therefore, I think they have done a fantastic job of getting us, you know, up to sort of filling us in quickly on what is it that um, we know and where are some of the unknowns. Uh, so uh, let me actually begin by cap, uh, recapitulate uh, uh, some of what we've heard. So what do we know about COVID-19 and air quality? What is known? Uh, we've heard a lot of stories. There's been a lot of newspaper reports that air quality has improved. You know, a lot of reports coming out that the Himalayas, for example, in South Asia, are visible for the first time. So we know that the lockdown has actually improved um, air quality, right? So that's an important thing for us to remember as we're thinking about how a poor air quality can lead to more infection. So if air quality is improving, should we not worry, right? Are we okay? So the other thing that we know is as a number of our speakers <clears throat> have pointed out, that places with higher air pollution, a number of studies have come out to show that there's higher uh, COVID infection rates in these areas, as um, uh, you know, the speakers have told us. And now, uh, the other thing that I'd like to throw into the mix um, uh, in today's uh, talk is what, um, what does this all mean uh, for when countries um, grow back? You know, should they does all of this mean that they should, uh, does this give them a, um, uh, you know, should they pursue green fiscal stimulus, for example, to deal with air pollution as they grow back? What does all of this mean in terms of policy? Now, let me also point you to what is not known. We've um, heard a lot about, uh, because we have fantastic satellite data, we've got um, we've seen um, these images before and after lockdowns where uh, NOx levels, uh, nitrogen dioxide levels, have actually uh, come down dramatically. But we don't really know um, uh, what has happened to the most harmful of air pollutants, which is PM uh, 2.5. And um, we also don't know at the moment what is driving some of these improvements, right? Then, as uh, both Anna and uh, Bob uh, uh, discussed, we really don't know what are the mechanisms uh, between that of transmission between air, uh, air pollution and um, uh, COVID-19 virus. Does it? Does the uh, some people have said that the virus hitchhikes on uh, particulate matters? Is that the case, or is it that uh, the virus? Um, you know, air pollution makes people more susceptible uh, to uh, any infection, and therefore it makes it susceptible to uh, the COVID-19 infection as well. And then, of course, if countries were to think about growing back greener, uh, what does this mean um, in terms of how would they design uh, this kind of fiscal stimulus package? Now, as we heard from a number of speakers, and this talk today is really about air pollution and the COVID infections. I'd like to um, try and summarize, and I'm not going to do full justice to the wealth of information that was shared, but there are three different mechanisms through which air pollution and COVID-19 um, infections can be correlated. One is transmission, and that, as I mentioned, um, uh, here, what my understanding um, and talking to epidemiologists and as Anna shared with us, it is not likely that the, um, uh, the COVID-19 infection is actually airborne or that it is uh, the, that the virus itself is hitchhiking on air pollution particles. And this comes because of evidence coming out of China, out of Wuhan, 
is showing that most of the transmission happened indoors within sort of uh, within families and it's not happening outside and which would mean that it's not the virus is not hitchhiking. But this still um, there is still a way in which air pollution can transmit the disease because and especially spikes in air quality, uh, sorry, spikes in air pollution uh, can irritate the throat and Bo pointed this out as well. And coughing is a way in which you can transmit. So when you, you know, if your, your throat is irritated and you cough a lot, that is a way in which you can transmit. Uh, so that there is a way in which air pollution can help, can increase the transmission of uh, the infection. Then um, it also air pollution uh, uh, will degrade um, the uh, upper airways um, in um, uh, in um, in your in your nostrils, and that degradation makes you more susceptible uh, to um, uh, getting uh, the infection. And then finally, as uh, Anna pointed out, and um, Bo also pointed our attention, air pollution increases the risk of a number of uh, uh, diseases. And these diseases have, people with these diseases have also been, um, have been found to have higher rates of uh, hospitalization. Um, so what, to summarize, what we do is we do expect, we do expect that air pollution is going to make the COVID-19 infection um, worse. However, as uh, our speakers have told us, we do not yet have the data uh, to be able to actually estimate this relationship carefully. And I'd like to give a shout out to Bo because of all the papers that I have seen, um, um, and as Anna pointed out, I think some of them are coming out way too quickly um, and some of them are not, uh, once put out are being criticized heavily. But uh, Bo, uh, Bo's paper really stands out in doing a careful um, job of both first understanding, um, first controlling for um, you know whether you have um, the infection, and then given that you have the infection, are you more likely? Uh, are you going to see more deaths? So you know, of all the papers that we see out there. Bo has done really a commendable job of trying to separate. But I think all in all, my uh, takeaway from all of this is, listen, we expect there to be a interaction, but it's way too early for us at this time. Uh, sorry, I'm getting a call. I don't know if um, it's related to us. Anyway, um, and so um, uh, now, so we know that air pollution levels matter, but uh, the question is, um, what has happened to air quality? If air quality is actually improved due to the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic, do we then care? Should we be worrying about air quality during this time? And I'd like to point out to you that air pollution level, air quality uh, matters now because even despite the lockdowns, we have not seen improvement in PM 2.5 levels. So what I've shown you here is some work that we are doing in the World Bank, where you know, we are trying to complement the literature on um, nitrogen, uh, where we are seeing a lot of um, you know, images of improvement in uh, nitrogen uh, dioxide. But are we seeing improvements in PM 2.5, which are more correlated with health impact? And here, um, what I'm showing you are three different graphs, one for uh, the Hubei, where the city of Wuhan is located in China, then uh, for PM 2.5 levels in uh, France, and finally, PM 2.5 levels in the Indo-Gangetic Plain. And the green um, is for 2019, the blue lines are for 2018, and the yellow lines are for 2020. Now, if you look um, in, um, for France, for example, we see almost no decline in PM 2.5 levels, even though, as Bo had shown us, there was declines in NOx levels. So the pollution that really matters is not declining. 
Now, um, in the intergenetic plane, on the other hand, we do see a decline in PM2.5 levels after the lockdown. But what has happened is in India, if, um, in this region, PM2.5 levels have declined even um, ahead of the lockdown. So we don't, uh, and the reason I'm pointing this out is because the lockdown in some ways is a way for us to better understand pollution can you, levels. Can you, well. can you begin to wind up, please? Yes. And so this is my last slide. Um, and so I think what I'd like to, you know, like to sort of leave you with is that even though we've heard that air pollution has improved um, with the lockdown, the pollution pollutant that matters, PM 2.5, um, has not necessarily declined uniformly. So it is still an, um, a problem. Then the uh, discussion that we heard from Bo as well as from Anna and the uh, as David pointed out there you expect to be there to be a relationship between uh, air pollution and uh, COVID-19 infections although the data at the moment is not there for us to be able to um, you know draw that relationship out definitely and so this all of this says that this is a chance air pollution is going to be is an issue now it's going to become more of an issue as countries lift their lockdowns and so you know this is a time for countries to start thinking about ways to um, green their fiscal stimulus and here it is a matter of both you know putting in measures to reduce their pollution but also measures to stimulate uh, demand. And I'll stop here, Richard. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Rubishi. Thank you to our speakers and our discussions. I'm going to ask these help you, whatever else comes in, throwing it at, at the both panelists and the discussions. So our first two questions, I think, are more for Anna than anyone else. So the first question from uh, a viewer in Bangladesh asks, can the virus survive dehydration? And there's a second question from someone who read The Economist, and there was a piece in The Economist that says, smokers don't seem to be heavily impacted by coronavirus, why? And then there is a third question, um, I guess it could be Anna Barubashi as well, and anyone else can take it, from one of our colleagues in the bank, Yuande, who asks or suggests, so should we really be targeting PM 2.5? So Anna, if you don't mind taking at least the first two questions and, uh, and the third one too, if you want to, but otherwise we could let all of take the third. Go ahead, okay. Anna. So yeah, no, the, the first question is about, uh, there's a wider context about how long the, the virus can survive in different environments. Um, I can't give you the exact figures of that, but I think it's sensitive to dehydration. It's certainly sensitive to ultraviolet light. Um, and then how long it lasts on uh, various surfaces. There are some studies um, on this, so it lasts longer on plastic, for example, than on paper. So paper might be a few hours, whereas plastic might be um, up to a week or more. But obviously the viability of the virus decreases um, um, over time. So uh, was the second question about the smokers? Um, I groan every time I get that question about the smoking, yeah. um, because it's, uh, I think if you smoke long enough to give yourself a chronic illness, you're at increased risk from COVID-19. Um, there were some early studies that suggested smokers were underrepresented in people that uh, were coming into hospital, and then some other studies that suggested there was selection bias um, involved in that, and that uh, it wasn't a, a, a true um, association. Um, but there is some interesting um, uh, research about the impact of nicotine on the receptor, there's the uh, ACE2 receptor that the virus enters and suggesting that uh, um, it might modify the infectivity. But I think the, uh, I think the message is don't smoke. Um, it's not going to stop you getting COVID-19, but um, there, there may be some interesting mechanistic uh, um, issues to, to follow up on that around the nicotine impact on the receptor. Did you also, I'm, I'm going to throw a couple more because there's one more which is directed at you. So it turns out that they wanted you to, uh, the person to, uh, who asked the question wanted you to answer whether 2.5 should be targeted. And there's also a question about diesel particles. And the question reads, we know that diesel particles serve as carriers for carcinogenic compounds. 
Given that we know this, could COVID virus particles stick to these, e.g. through 2.5? Yeah. Okay. So, which, which should we target? Um, I would I would go for both PM two point five and NO two, and the NO two because there is uh, mechanistic evidence about NO two exposure um, increasing susceptibility to respiratory viruses, and there is a direct inflammatory um, effect um, in in the lungs from NO two. PM10, we have the most uh, information about uh, impacts generally on, on the body. I mean, PM2.5, we, we know a lot about how, uh, um, how how bad it is for you. So I would target that as well. In a lot of countries, PM2.5 and NO2 are very highly correlated because they're the same source, which is road transport. So actually, by tackling the road transport, then you, you bring both of them down. Um, diesel, that's a very good point. Um, that I, Nobody's done the study yet on the on the diesel as to whether uh, they're more dangerous. Certainly, they look like they are potentially the more dangerous components of the particulate fraction um, is diesel, and that's been part of the reason why uh, um, there's been a lot of efforts to try and reduce emissions from diesel vehicles and to reduce the diesel fleet uh, on the on the roads um, in in quite a number of countries. Can I just while I have the floor just talk about PM two point five as well in in Europe? So um, in the UK, we have had PM 2.5 episodes during lockdown, which have been related to the weather. So um, we've, uh, because the precursors are around um, and the hot sunny weather that we've had um, over the initial period of our lockdown um, encouraged uh, the formation or secondary formation of particulates. And that's why we've seen quite high levels that probably impacting on France um, as well. Um, and I think, you know, there are lots of different sources of particulate matter, whereas the NO2 tends to primarily come from transport and from industrial sources. So if you lock down on those, then you reduce the NO2 levels. So I think that's that's some of the differences which, that, uh, uh, um, that, that have been commented on in terms of what you actually see of levels. Thanks. Just two questions, and anyone from the panel can take them. The first one is, do we have any information on the impacts of indoor air pollution? That's one question. I'm going to throw another one. What kinds of green stimulus policy should we use for, so that we get improvements in air quality? So let's take these two, and there's another two which are coming up. Uh, uh, Marissa, do you want to take, take yeah, one of them I'm at least? To, so um, I would, you know, I'll uh, and, um, appreciate if Anna will come in on the indoor. I haven't seen any studies actually looking at uh, the infections, largely because, you know, the data in developing countries where there is uh, more use of, um, you know, solid fuels for cooking and indoor, so higher levels of indoor air pollution, the data are just not uh, there. But one would expect, right, as I said, I think here we are in a situation where, you know, you can't wait for the perfect data to be able to draw some of these conclusions. I just don't think, I mean, we have enough evidence on the harmful effects of air pollution, and we have enough evidence uh, of the kinds of mechanisms that are likely to be uh, making the virus, infections of the virus worse. So in high levels of indoor air pollution, you're going to have a lot of coughing, you have people living together, you're going to see more infections. I mean, it is make, makes sense. And here, I think sense has to overtake lack of um, data. So that's, um, but, you know, Anna can come in. In terms of what kind of green fiscal stimulus policies, and I think this comes back also to what Anna said, I think it's important to understand the source structure of uh, PM 2.5 pollution. And what we are finding, unlike in developed countries, where uh, there's a huge correlation between NOx, uh, so nitrogen dioxide, and PM 2.5, um, and therefore traffic is the biggest contributor, in developing countries, it's actually a very complicated source structure for PM 2.5. And it's a very multi-sector problem. So household uh, solid fuel use is a big contributor. Agriculture is a big contributor, and not just because of the crop burning, but also because of the secondary particle formation. High use of, we're finding in India, for example, very high emissions of nitrogen, uh, of, of, sorry, of ammonia, from agriculture because of overuse of fertilizers and um, is leading to secondary particle formation where it interacts with NOx and SOx. 
So the policies, in fact, that we need um, cut across these sectors. So let me give you just one example. For example, a green policy, a green fiscal policy could be uh, removing some of the subsidies from uh, of fertilizers, because what has happened in India is there's very high subsidies for, uh, for um, urea, which has led to overuse of urea in uh, agriculture, which in turn is leading to high ammonia emissions. And so removing the subsidy will give the fiscal space for government, and those subsidies can be used as an economic stimulus. So you have the stimulus part of it, and then you're reducing the emissions by reducing ammonia emissions. Um, and so that is one example, but happy to discuss, you know, almost every sector one can come up with a set of policies. Thanks. Okay, great, Rubashi, because you asked another question there, which I won't put in front of you, which was sort of really questioning. You know, is, is the data right? Is pollution really coming down? There's a question for David, but others might wish to chime in as well. And the question specifically is a classic one that I was waiting to check to, to come from Florhard, which is really given non-pharmaceutical interventions and social distancing are endogenous. How have you taken care of all of these endogenous impacts, you know, policies, etc., uh, like NPIs and social distancing? David, over to you. And Bo, you might want to jump in as well. Uh, Richard, can you hear me okay? I see my image is, seems to be frozen, but I'm hoping the microphone is not. We frozen. can hear you loud, loud and clear, David. Please go ahead. I'll let you know if you, we can't hear you. Okay. Well, there's a whole suite of technical issues that one has to address in thinking about estimation in this context. And, you know, Bo has touched on some of them. On, on the issue of how one might control for differential policies across spatial units of uh, for example, social distancing. Uh, of course, in principle, the answer is um, one would would like to be able to do that. In the context of doing work like this for 3,000 U.S. counties or 1,500 municipalities in the Philippines, uh, the information base is, is sparse, to put it mildly. And so you're really thrown back then on the issue of whether the errors and variables problem here might haunt you uh, perversely in looking at the, the results we've gotten. That is to say, could there be some covariates of distancing which also would affect the variables that we're trying to explain so that we're getting a biased view of the effect of the variables that we've observed? In fact, let me generalize that. Uh, I think uh, a couple of colleagues have referred to the errors and variables problem in the measurement of cases for uh, coronavirus. In the US, for example, the, there's the New York Times database, the Johns Hopkins database, there are other databases. Everyone knows that there are uh, variations in reporting and the same problems apply there. Now, econometrically, there are three cases. The first case is uh, there, there is a sort of a random incidence of reporting. Well, that's okay. Econometrics was basically built to handle random variation uh, in, in the variable being explained. That's not a problem. The second case would be whether uh, there might then be um, some some variation in variables that is perverse in the sense that there may be a co-varying factor on the right hand side of these equations which causes an effect to be over or underestimated now i think that's that would be the question that we need to look at in the context of whether or not distancing is a problem we have only the roughest of notions by the way of whether or not stated policies of states or counties in the u.s are having any effect on distancing uh, it seems quite evident that many so-called red states have many metro areas where distancing has been fairly effective. There are many so-called blue states where it is quite obvious that in some contexts distancing has been absolutely ineffective. And so we then have to ask ourselves whether or not there might be some underlying model of causality which would cause some of the characteristics we're looking at to affect distancing. The problem I have in trying to do these estimates right now and the problem that's kind of frustrating is we ha there has never been a test of that. So we have no idea what those covariates might be or what the signs in the equation might be. So this is all a, a bit of throwing up of the hands here. I fervently agree that there might be an error of variables problem here. It might lead to biased estimates of the effects that we're looking at. Uh, but we simply at this point do not know enough to say anything systematic. There's one further thing I I'd like to add, and it interests me. The problem of spatial covariation, as Bo has said, is very important in this context. And it's not clear, for example, in the U.S. that the county is the right unit of observation because 
Many phenomena are more regionally general and they vary over space. I didn't have time, for example, to point this out, but in the US determinants of life expectancy equation, temperature enters into the OLS version of that, but not into the spatial econometric version. The reason for that is temperature is much more widely diffuse on average than county level units would suggest. So there really are not that many effective degrees of freedom as far as temperature is concerned uh, uh, that we're looking at. So I, I mean, I, I confess to some frustration with this. Uh, it's not evident to me that anything that we're looking at is leading to any systematic bias uh, one way or the other in the results, but I readily acknowledge that we could undoubtedly explain the variation that remains unexplained if we had better micro information about distance. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, David. That was very comprehensive. Bo, did you want to give a brief answer? Because there's a couple sure. of other things. Uh, and if you wanted to have any concluding remarks, you've got the floor for a sentence or two to go of, of your words of wisdom for us to conclude with. And I'm going to do the same for the others. I can add, I can add two, two things to what David already said, and that is uh, on uh, the errors in variables. So if there's a lot of measurement uh, error, which there likely is, then uh, you would actually basically uh, expect the bias towards zero. Uh, so that would mean that uh, if there's a lot of extra noise uh, in, in, your in, in, in your data, uh, which includes uh, uh, noise that has no correlation at all, you would actually expect your, your bias to be towards zero. So the fact that you're still finding a, a very significant uh, parameter, uh, actually in, in, in the situation where you do expect measurement errors is actually even stronger because you would expect the results to be more conservative uh, when there's a lot of measurement error. Second, uh, if this measurement error is actually not all too random and there's a, a, a systematic uh, measurement error, which uh, we could also expect. So if there's a convenience sampling so, there, for example, doctors are more aware of uh, respiratory illnesses in areas with high pollution because historically there have been a lot of patients there, and they're more eager to test for corona, hence you see more uh, cases. That would be more uh, problematic because then you would expect, uh, uh, just purely because of the sampling strategy, to have more cases in polluted areas. And then I would say, well, it really becomes the question whether that uh, as a theory is more far-fetched than simply following the evidence that suggests that a particular matter is bad for your health, period. Uh, and we see uh, a correlation with COVID cases. Uh, and then it's really saying, well, what is more far-fetched? And uh, it's leading toward following the evidence right now. Um, so that's just a quick addition to what David already said. Okay, great. Thanks. Look, we're, we're coming to the fact that we've got three minutes left. So, Anna, in a minute, you wanted to come in on indoor air pollution, anything else? And if there's time, I'd like to give a minute to Urvashi and to show me if they want to take a minute to just any, any last words of wisdom. Thanks. Over to you, Anna. Uh, just to comment on the indoor air, it's something we don't know very much about in uh, developed countries either. Um, I think we neglect it as our peril. Um, and one of the things we've been discussing is increased use of cleaning agents. So we've got more volatile organic compounds and uh, bleach fumes um, in the house uh, potentially than previously. Um, I will come back to the issue of uh, what we learned from SARS, I think, as my final comment. Um, so I think the positive thing about SARS was that public health measures helped conquer the disease before we had a vaccine and um, before we even genotyped it at that, at that stage. So um, I think, you know, we need to keep in mind public health, just basic public health um, uh, uh, measures can be very effective in controlling um, this disease. And um, that's that's where I'll leave it at, but thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Those are, those are indeed wise words. Over to you, over to you, you've got a minute. Yeah, thanks, Richard. I won't take. I just want to say again, uh, you know, I've learned so much from these excellent you presentations. Can't hear you. Uh, very interesting. Oh, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Now we can't. You're muted. Can now you you're hear not me muted. Now, Richard? Yes, yes. Now we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, just to say that uh, you know, excellent presentations. I learned a lot. 
But I just want to say that, listen, air pollution matters. Uh, we know it's a problem, but we also need to uh, point out that it still matters. And so we don't want policymakers to sort of take their eye off the ball. And I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Uvishi. Shomik, over to you. Then I'll have to one sentence we will then call today. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I really found the presentations to be insightful and providing at least uh, policymakers in developing country cities a lot more information on the transmission parts of the coronavirus. As we go forward, I'd like to make an urge to do more work on three dimensions. One, let's try to get a better understanding about land use and transportation because a lot of patterns we see today, both in terms of connectivity and the spread of the virus, but the emissions and the PM 2.5 are sort of driven by an underlying economic structural issue of how land in a city is organized and it's organized around industrial use, residential use, and commercial use, and how transportation and the choice of transportation modes link up these places. So getting a better understanding of land and transportation would be really helpful. Second, I think, we, in, in all the work that we're seeing on measures of density, we should be more sort of proactive in thinking about amenities and living space and not only physical measures of density. So let's look at economic geography, not only physical geography. And the final part, I think, is that it'll be really useful for the group in kind of trying to, in the short term, distill. So what is it that city leaders can really do. If a lot of the work you know, will be led by mayors and the remit of mayors in developing countries is very limited, what is it that we can really help city leaders do both on the density issue, but also the equality issue versus where city leaders need to work with higher levels of government? Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Shermik. Um, I'd like to thank the presenters very much and the discussers too, equally. And uh, might I say my final comment, I'm sure everyone that was listening in has learned something new, if not a lot new. And we really have to thank you all. It was rich in material, rich in new research, and we've all come away knowing an awful lot more. So thank you. My final point is that apparently the recording of this event and all the materials are on a web page. Uh, perhaps there can be an email letting people know what the link to that web page is. So with that, we're just two minutes over time, which is not so bad. Let me really profusely thank our speakers, particularly those joining from a different time zone in Europe, and indeed uh, David as well, even if you're on the same time zone, Shomik, Urvishi, thank you so much, and thank you to all our listeners. This was a really, really excellent session that we had. Many thanks. And have a great day and a great evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Richard.